Hello, welcome and welcome back. This is Jacob and today we are going to be beginning a new, smaller narration and character voicing uh, series here on the channel with the different endings for Mizuki and Cerulea Arbor aka Integrated Strategies 3. So in this mini-series that will at one point have four parts in it, uh, we are going to be going in each part over one of the different endings, the journey along the way, the intro cutscene, and uh, many, many other little things. However, before we begin with anything, I would like to say a couple of words, considering this is the first episode, so allow me to do a quick little intro here, uh, and uh, then we shall begin with the journey. So... Point number one, very quickly, is a quick correction, and I am happy to correct myself here on this one. Uh, a thing that I said on one of the live streams for uh, for IS3 when we uh, initially began with that is a thing that I was under. I was pretty much under the assumption that every single thing of this uh, story here is a what-if scenario where the Seaborn are essentially winning. However, when I was doing research on uh, this very first video to uh, find some extra details, uh, I found out that, uh, well, ending one is actually canon to the narrative of Arknights, to the overall world building characters, yada yada. So, ending one is canon. And everything, all the three text entries that come with it once you uh, complete all the extra objectives, uh, are all canon. However, endings 2, 3, and 4, 4 has yet to be added as of this recording, but all the other endings are a what-if scenario, which is essentially the Doctor observing through Mizuki's help and a, a device that is, or rather, a monument? Whatever you want to call it. Uh, let's go with device for now. A device that you, that you find along the journey, and through Mizuki's help, the Doctor is able to observe different timelines, essentially, in which shit goes down, and it goes down hard. You'll see how in future parts. But in today's part, like I said, we're just gonna cover ending one uh, and other little details that come along with it. So that's bullet point number one. Number two. For anybody who is listening to this and is asking, and um, would like to ask, is this gonna spoil uh, the stories of Undertides and Stultifera Navis? The short answer to that is, as we're gonna go through this in the future, yes. It will definitely spoil significant uh, plot plot points and uh, character characters from uh, Undertides and Stultifera. Therefore, if you don't want to continue with this and want to return to this later, Feel free to do so. It will the video will not run away. Uh, however, if you do want to listen to the stories, I did narrations on those uh, months and months ago at this point, and I will leave links to the Undertides and Stultifera Navi story in the description of the video. I will also leave a link to a full narration of Mizuki's uh, file, 200% uh, trust file, and all of his voice lines also in the description of the video if you want to familiarize yourself with our little seaborn uh, boy here, our precious, precious little seaborn. And yes, if you were unaware and are listening to this, he is a seaborn. It is very well stated everywhere about him that he is indeed a true and true seaborn, not just a... Uh, maybe he is, maybe he isn't, maybe he is half and half, nope, he is a seaborn. But ending number one today will teach us why he is still human, and why so many other Seaborn that we meet along the line are also still either fully human or partially human. Or rather, why are, why are they retaining their uh, sense of self and their humanity? However, before we begin with that, I would like to say very quickly, and I will rant about this a bit at the end of this video, uh, if you have not read Stultifera Navis, and are planning to read it as it is right now in the Intermezzi section of the game. I would highly advise, pay very close attention, go slow through it if you're gonna do it yourself, cause a lot of stuff will be lost after you click it away. The story you can experience no problem, but little details along the way, along the way you cannot. The Intermezzi section of uh, Stultifera Navis is extremely gutted, and I will talk about this 
at the end of this video what I mean and I will show you as well. But for now, let us proceed. So, our little story here starts off with Mizuki, obviously, and will lead to our ending number one titled Precious Days. Everyday life is the greatest joy that fate bestowed upon the living, and indeed, peaceful days are the most joyous of all. Our little journey, however, begins with a cutscene that I have no access to, sadly, anymore, because it is not yet available, maybe it will be available in the future, somewhere here in the recorder, but right now it is not available. So I will have to read it very quickly off uh, the wiki page, it, there is not much text, text, so let's go through it. Our scene begins with a ba black background and the words Someone once posed this question to Mizuki. How do be you become a better human? The scene then changes, if I could find it, to this one. And it says, back then he had only just escaped from the maw of death and there was nothing on his mind but confusion and shock. Now he has grown up. As he grew older, Mizuki gained new viewpoints and perspectives throughout his life, instilling him with the confidence to now answer this question. So he goes out to the coast, heeding the guidance of the wind, the tides, and we many. He arrives at the residence of the old bishop. However, and here the, mu the uh, screen turns to block black once again, and we get the text saying, Mother, where are we going? And then we're in the menu. And that is the introduction receipt. From here on, we embark on a journey, and eventually we'll reach a couple of mid-bosses that we will obviously be adding only in today's episode here, so I don't have to add them over uh, the next couple of episodes. But along the journey, we also encounter a certain someone else. And who that is? Well, let's go and take a look. So, on our journey through the Iberian coast, we also from time to time will step into contact with an operator by the designation or name Tulip. Tulip is a Rhode Island operator uh, that is stationed in Iberia. And right now we're gonna go over the file that is readily available here in game for Tulip, plus her voice files. Uh, she does not have an English VA uh, as of this recording, therefore I will leave it on the JP uh, VA and uh, once we go to the uh, voice files, you'll have to pay attention to the screen of what she's saying, because, well, there is no, en there is no English for her yet. But let's introduce Tulip. Basic info. Codename Tulip. Gender female, combat experience 12 years, place of birth Iberia, date of birth November 8th, race Fidia, height 177 centimeters, infection status confirmed infected by medical examination. Physical exam. Physical strength. Standard. Mobility outstanding. Physical resilience. Excellent. Technical acumen. Standard. Combat skill. Outstanding. And origi Originium Arts Assimilation. Standard. Uh, here I would also like to say very quickly that yes, just like in IS2 where you could recruit elite operators Shaw and the others, uh, you can also recruit her here in IS3. Uh, Tulip, that is. And she appears as a Vanguard 5-star operator. I personally like to call her a 5-star Vanguard Shen because of the skill that she uses. Her uh, one and only skill essentially is pretty much kind of the same as uh, Shen's skill too, where she just zoops and boops between uh, multiple targets if she kills one with uh, the skill being active. AKA she hits a target multiple times and generates DP. And uh, she's very fun to use, and I'm very sad that she's not actually normally recruitable <laughs> because of it. Anyway, continuing with the file. Profile. Tulip is Rhode Island's Iberian Affairs Officer in Charge. 
Owing to the special circumstances of Iberia, she continues to provide rescue and medical assistance to the local infected populace as an individual, a swordsman whose skill has been tempered in life and death situations. She is adept at dealing with the threats from the sea and always leads the charge on the battlefield, quickly dispatching enemies to make way for other operators to advance. Clinical analysis. Imaging tests show, uh, show the indistinct outlines of eternal organs obscured by abnormal shadows, originium granules detected in the circulatory system. The subject is confirmed to be infected with oripathy. Cell originium assimilation 12%, left leg shows clear signs of infection and crystallization. And uh, if you look closely here on her left thigh that is uncovered, you can actually see the uh, crystals poking through the skin like a crack on the skin, essentially. Uh, anyway, blood originium crystal density 0.18 units per liter. The quality of Iberia's healthcare is relatively poor. As such, whenever Tulip returns to Rhode Island for the briefing, additional medical supplies beyond what she requires may be allocated. Archive file number one. Tulip is the descendant of pirates. Before the profound silence, pirates used to commandeer the king's vessels and rob any ships that sail along the Iberian coast. Among them, some robbed the rich to give to the poor. Ever since the resident Ever since, the residents of the Iberian coastline often sang the praises of such heroic outlaws. After the profound silence, however, the seas became infested with seaborne and pirates vanished from Iberia. That said, although the age of piracy is long behind us, their stories are still told to this day by their descendants. Thanks to this, even as a small child, Tulip gradually uh, greatly admired the seas her ancestors once sailed. By contrast, the lectures of the bishops became comparatively less interesting. Nevertheless, Tulip learned much during middle school, including how to read and write, and also came to realize the tragic reality of the Inquisition's rule. Ever since, Tulip has considered the Inquisition an evil that tramples upon the freedoms of others. As a way of putting her personal sense of justice in practice, she led a small group of bandits and wandered Iberia to rob the rich. However, due to the great uh, disparity in their strength, she and her friends were ultimately captured by the Inquisition. While they were being escorted to the Bastion of Hallowed Saints, they were attacked by a group of sea terrors, leading to Tulip and her gang being temporarily pardoned to help fight against the monsters. Although their chances of survival were slim, she gave it her all against their common foe, until Catastrophe fell. The Catastrophe killed every living being in the vicinity other than her, and left her infected. Since then, she has been orchestrized by everyone she met. That was the first time she realized just how lonely and helpless Iberius infected can be. She then took on the name Tulip, and, devo and devoted what meager strength she had to helping Iberius infected. During her investigation into Aegir, Katsit learned of Tulip's feast, uh, feats and formed a long-term agreement to exchange Tulip's intel for the supplies she, met, she needed. After the founding of Rhode Island, Katsit then extended her an invitation to become its officer in charge for Iberian affairs. She accepted after confirming that Rhode Island truly is a company that aims to help the infected. And as you can see by this last passage, she was already sort of on board with Rhode Island, or at least she was already uh, acquainted with Kaltzit before the formation of Rhode Island. And uh, prob I don't know if she would fit under one of the oldest members of Rhode Island, but at least from the founding of Rhode Island, she's one of the oldest members. Because obviously Rhode Island has members that stem back all the way from... Uh, <laughs> from uh, Bobble and stuff, but yeah. She's a pretty old operator. Sadly, not recruitable. Yet. Alright, but that leads us into the voice files, which means I will shut up and she will talk. So, enjoy. Message, <laughs> Okay, 
さて向こうの連中にはがっかりしてもらうことになるだろうね活目しろ生きてすらいない身に死など訪れない命をもって罪を償い正義の声を聞けようやく四季の仕事を手放せそうだね <laughs> that marks all of her voice files. Obviously, she doesn't have that many considering she is not recruitable. So, that is all of it. And now, we shall make a small little detour and introduce the bosses that we meet on the halfway point. So, let's hop over. So, then, this brings us to the mid range bosses. Uh, one quick note here, I did not yet, even though I did it multiple times at this point, did not yet en uh, encounter the variant to this little boy here, uh, but I will include his description as well into this video, even though there is mu not much to add, but we shall go over it. But, in order, one of the many bosses, and that was kind of, not gonna lie, was kind of a shock to see him in here, but yes. One of the bosses, one of the mid-bosses that you can encounter is Saint Carmen. And it says here, the last surviving saint of Iberia, living well past mortal life expectancy. His longevity came at a price, but he remembers his duty and his enemies, despite having lost his reason. Then we have a variant of him called Just Saint Iberia. The last surviving saint of Iberia, living well past mortal life expectancy. His longevity came at a price, but he will hunt Iberia's enemies for as long as the flame of his life still burns. And I would like to quickly just say here, it is a chance that you encounter uh, the variants. And the chance, I think if I understood it correctly, the chance grows uh, depending on how low the overall... Uh, value of the light is anyway continuing the next enemy is a double combo we have the tide linked bishop which says a bishop that has partially mutated it is partially human partially sea terror even eager technology has a role to play in the evolution of we many so yeah these two bosses appear at the same time uh, you need to kill them at the same time as well for them to actually die. They don't have much HP or health or whatever. They're very easily killed. Uh, however, the, the bishop on top is a bit out of reach <laughs> for the beginning. So it can be uh, a bit finicky. But you can slow uh, this boy down before, uh, before he reaches the gate. However, uh, the tide-linked archon, as it's called, does have... A variant which like I said I didn't unlock sadly but it is called the tide linked immortal and the only difference in text is that it says the product of both technology and evolutionary instinct and the difference again is just a color difference which uh, makes the yellow be blue then we have the path shaper Seaborn task with exploring evolutionary pathways, its fractals mapping out uh, dead ends so that we many can stay on the right path. The other variant of that boss is the lingering path shaper. Seaborn task with exploring evolutionary pathways, its injuries and those suffered by its fractals become a guide for the evolution of we many. There are also secret bosses along the way which I will not cover in these descriptions. Outside of maybe one, but that will be for a future episode. Uh, however, right now, uh, we shall cover our first big boss. The boss of ending one. Paranoia Illusion. And it says, An eager girl who went out of control after ingesting seaborne cells. Her throat makes no voice, for the prayers of we many have blocked it. She is drowned in power, becoming, becoming what she once detested the most. So, from here on, we're gonna go into a recording that I did of the first ending. Uh, the recording has no voiceover, so enjoy. It will be a <laughs> sort of quick battle. Uh, had 
pretty good luck on that ending with uh, both units and um, <laughs> and the things I gathered along the way. So uh, enjoy that, and I will see you then directly in the outro cutscene. So enjoy. そう、戦争決死を俺の貴重な時間を無駄にしないためにな。全員の行動力を奪う。そう、腕もがいてろ。<laughs> You've done well, Mizuki. Sir. She simply was not as perfect as you. She was so eager to change, even if the Herald's gift led her astray. That was nevertheless what she hoped for. But what about her memories and her song? She seemed as fond of singing as ever. In that form, all she can manage is sounds that terrify her. I only provide a choice. As for where the individual ends up, I don't think anyone else can make that decision. 
you don't care at all about what she has become? Individuals like that are indeed uncommon. Most humans have no idea what they are seeking, or are easily manipulated by some burst of emotion. When they swallow the gift of the Herald, their consciousness is subs subsumed by the instincts of we many, and they turn into a sea terror, or some kind of incomplete seaborn, eager to swim out into the ocean. Highmoor was able to revert back from this state, presumably because she wished from the bottom of her heart to capture those human qualities she so cherished. Just like you, in a sense, Mizuki. Hmm. But you did not undergo that process. Even if you accepted your seaborn self, your cognition of yourself would still shape you into what you are now. You accepted becoming seaborn in its entirety, and decided to become human, just like I once did. But she failed. Because of fear or loneliness, I can't say for sure. As a result, she is trapped somewhere between success and failure. Though she accepted the gift, her refusal to have anything else excised from her naturally created a dissonance. If the blueprint for the future drafted by your experiment rejects those who aren't resilient enough, then it can't be a successful adaptation of evolution for humanity. True, my dear child. True indeed. I must return to the drawing board again, seeing as that is the answer you're giving me. Do you still remember the question I asked you? How do you become a better human? You've given me a very good answer. See, rightfully accepting this power has opened your mind, and it seems you've already fully understood my goal. Perhaps if I work hard enough, all humans who taste the fruit of the gods can become as wise as you. Can a life form like that still be called human? A true human would know how to utilize the strength of will that transcends physical matter to overcome the side effects of their trappings. And at that stage, those who are unable to overcome or only able to lament the weakness of their mind and body are unfit to bear the weight of the title, human. Hmm. I will let Highmore live. A banal of decision, but are you free to do? But you are free to do as you see fit. Your every action will serve as an example to those who come after you. I'm very glad to see you, Mizuki. Just as I said before, as long as you do not stray from your path, our fates will intersect eventually. We shall meet again. <laughs> he is as stubborn as ever. As Highmore slowly wakes up, sniffing and sobbing quietly. You're awake. It must have taken a lot of energy to turn to that form. Want me to whip something up for you? Hmm. Okay. Wait, hold on. What's that? Oh, these. Uh, they're your limbs. Uh, uh, huh? You weren't able to complete your seaborne metamorphosis, so most of that profiliated tissue ended up falling off. I helped remove the rest of the stuff that was stuck onto you, so you w should look like a completely normal person now. Nobody will ever know the difference. Come on, dig in while the meat's still fresh. You'll recover some of your strength. At least. Uh, uh, um, I... I don't know about this one. <laughs> don't worry about it. This one's co This one cooks fast. That, that, that's not what I meant. Huh. Maybe I overcooked this first batch a little. Guess I'll try it first. <laughs> 
Mizuki. Hmm. Are are you hungry now? Uh, no. I, I wanted to ask about something else. Um, Sir Cicero left. I proved how blind and incompetent I am. I have nothing left. That might be true. But as long as I have good stuff to eat and drink and games to play, life's pretty comfy for me. Those hobbies that let you reject the Seaborn can also give you a purpose to live on. I'm sure of it. Are you sure you don't want a bite? Uh, I'm, I'm good. Hmm, alright. I didn't bring any dry food with me, but I do know a good place with lots of nice people who can cook all sorts of delicious food. Might even be able to help you get a sense of humanity again. How about it? Want to come with me? <laughs> okay. And thus... Highmore goes to Rhode Island. So, now we shall go over the three text parts that are unlocking by completing the ending multiple times, the ending battle that is multiple times, uh, or under specific conditions. Ending 1 and 2, basically ending 1 or rather part 1 here cro titled Crossroads you get just by completing uh, the first uh, first battle against High Moors Seaborn form. Uh, ending or rather part 2 you will get after completing the same fight 3 different times. And part 3 you get by beating the fight without... Uh, bringing her to the ground, aka her form is floating, if you stun her she will uh, be grounded from there on, on from there on, and uh, the condition to unlock part 3 will be lost, meaning you do need to uh, defeat her while she's still flying. Anyway, let's begin with part number 1, Crossroads. <clears throat> The few defensive measures left behind in the asylum are obviously no match for Opianus. After brushing aside a trap or two and clearing out some seaborne disguised as ordinary objects, he now finds himself standing inside Cicero's laboratory. For a few days, Opianus has followed the tracks of Cicero, a church of the deep bishop. While the bishop had no chance of surpassing Opianus in terms of strength or skill, he did seem to have a knack for prolonging his life. Leaving behind a severed limb, he fled from Opianus' grasp. Ordinarily, the experienced hunter would have given chase to finish off his wounded prey. However, one particular thought gave him pause. Generally speaking, the bishops of the deep tend to operate around Iberian settlements, often mingling with the villagers to spread their faith. However, this place was remote and barren. Even when the bishop was attacked, nobody came to his aid. No villagers, not even sea terrors. Truly an unprecedented occurrence. Unless... To ass assage his doubts, Ulpianus decides to set aside the hunt for Cicero, instead searching the surrounding area to see if he could find any leads. After a few days, he discovers the asylum that housed Cicero's laboratory. Everything in the cave laboratory is neat and orderly, with all the documents and letters categorized and carefully stored in dry bookshelves. Opianus has no interest in Cicero's research. He has seen far too many experiments that blaspheme humanity and trample across ethical lines. What he cares about more is the correspondence between Cicero and the other Church of the Deep Bishops. Normally, when a Church of the Deep Bishop appears in seaborn form, their research and letters will have been completely destroyed by their warped carcass. But not this time. Cicero obviously did not expect to be raided by an abyssal hunter. Perhaps he chose to flee in a completely different direction in an attempt to prevent Ulpianus from discovering his trove of knowledge. Out of caution, he glances across the catalogue of research topics. After confirming that none of the now halted research topics would have any sort of influence on Eager, he turns his attention towards the personal notes and letters. Upon the envelopes appear some names that make his heart skip a beat. 
There were people scattered among Eager's technical coll coll uh, colleges, ac academies, and art world. Some were designated as the bishops of the deep many years ago. Most of them still maintain considerable status and influence in Eager to this day. Just from seeing these names, one can already surmise the extent of the damage the cult has inflicted upon the whole of Eager society. That was only the beginning. Information such as the close conversations that took place following the hunt of Vishar Bla, the bishop's surveillance of the uh, surviving abyssal hunters, and the trajectory of Eager's movements over time revealed themselves to Ulpianus through the letters. As time passed, Ishar Mla's biological existence remained inside the body of the hunter who slew him, and the bishops began to take a greater interest in this particular hunter's whereabouts, as well as the movements of the other leviathans. As of the more recently dated letters, the bishops uh, seem to have reached a conclusion. They wish to send the hunter who slew Ishar Mla back to the ocean. Only then can Ishar Mla awaken once more, as long as he can meet the one who caused the profound silence. As for his personal opinion, Cicero seemed to believe that the profound silence would speed up the amalgamation of humanity and seaborne, and that the technology to transform abyssal hunters may become mainstream in Eger. When a generation of human beings accepts the gifts in order to fight against the Seaborn, they will then be able to give birth to the perfect humans he envisions. Without a doubt, he sought to advance this plan despite the disagreement of the other bishops. The words written on the letters are like a trawling net, attempting to entangle and kill the Abyssal Hunters and Aegir within it. But even to the end, Ulpianus is unable to piece together the complete picture of the conspiracy. He has run out of time. As he reaches out towards an unre unread letter, Seawater suddenly rushes into the laboratory, the torrents consuming all of Cicero's research, then the sea terrors follow. The sea terrors that seemingly swarm the entire asylum slither, tear and bite, trying to free their kin from within Ulpianus' body. Opianus raises the anchor. He has already heard about the incident at Salviento. Even now, the Church of the Deep still plans on de uh, designing a hunter who can capture him. As long as he knows, as long as he still lives, he will not allow that to happen. So yeah, this was a tiny little side adventure of uh, our dear, always grumpy looking Opianus, who appears for the first time in the Stultifera Navis story. Anyway, we continue on to part number two, which is titled To Usurp Divinity. This is from Cicero's point of view. And it says, All living things have the instinct to grow, survive, reproduce, and migrate, constantly walking down the path of evolution in order to adapt to their environment. But, but why do there exist creatures that pursue self-optimization with an uncanny persistence far surpassing what can be considered individual survival instinct, as if pulled along by some higher purpose. Eager will not give me an answer. I knocked on the doors of the Church of the Deep, if only to seek their resources and their perspectives. But even after extensive research, accumulating fame, and becoming a respected bishop, I only ever got answers like, everything is touched by God's hand, which did not satisfy me. I once again took up my position as a biologist and tried to survive all the life forms on this continent, and though I dare not say my search was exhaustive, I ultimately could not find an answer despite observing countless organisms. Only the creatures of the ocean continue to defy every existing theory or hypothesis. In the end, I must admit that God does, in fact, exist. Not a god like Ishar Mla, nor a metaphysical deity from people's imaginations. There must be some noble will that transformed them and gave them a higher calling, driving them to become far more efficient and orderly than humans and further explore the possibilities of life until they fi finally become God. Even when I was young, my colleagues and I had been astounded by the social structure of the bee colonies we observed on land, and now we are on the cusp of having a blueprint for living organisms 
that is far more logical and ideal than even a bee colony. In the never-ending cycle of the distribution and circulation of resources, all conflict and hatred must be ended through the expurgation of the soil in which they take root. There is no need to elucidate God's true form, nor to speculate on the meaning of God. I will find God's laboratory, usurp God's olive branch, and bring fruit to mankind, even if it is not meant to be souped upon by mankind. And this, indubitably, is the right granted to every human researcher who attempts to overcome this dilemma. And now for part number three. The sound of withering. This is about Highmore. So, let's begin. <clears throat> the elder shakes his head, placing the thing that had slipped from, his, from the girl's hand, the oath he exchanged with that herald, into the box. Though the girl had accompanied him and studied under him for several years, the old man had always been hesitant to give her that which she sought, precisely because of what is now happening. Distributing patterns begin to blossom one by one, silently clawing their way through the gravel. Her very existence seems to tear apart her surroundings, plants and flowers wilting around her, sapped of their vitality. The life of a sea terror has always played a harmonious role with the cycle of nature's ecology, taking nutrients from it as needed and returning them to it as needed, all to create a more agreeable environment for its kin. But her life does not. Contradictory needs torment her and everything around her. Now the power she once wished for flows through her, but she cannot envision herself holding onto these things she finds beautiful in life. Even the wondrous singing voice passed down to her through her mother's blood is drowned out by the calls of we many. Pain. Pain is all that is trying to tear her body apart, roaring out around her with an inaudible remorse. This pain stems only from her resistance, her unwillingness, her incompleteness. She cannot accept herself. She does not accept the calls issued to her by we many, but, also, but she also cannot accept the humans who slew her parents. Always losing things, always having things taken away. Why must it always be her? Why must she give her own life force to we many, or to the humans just to preserve their living space? She rejects all of it, but after what seems like an eternity, she appears to finally exhaust her ability to resist. A bouquet of beautiful yet empty flowers blooms along the gravel, hesitating, withering. And that is all of the parts and the ending, first ending to IS-3. So that is pretty much, th this ending pretty much confirms what was sorta eluded for a long long time, uh, and that is why certain, certain humans manage to stay human even after they are fully absorbed or rather their bodies fully transform technically into seaborn and that is a certain connection the will essentially they will themselves back to being human they have desires that they cannot let go and that is keeping them in place one such thing can actually be also observed in a recently released uh, operator record from um Deep Caller, which pretty much also talks about the same thing, but in a slightly different way, where she explain she herself, uh, if I remember correctly, explains why she uh, stays the way she is and why she keeps doing uh, the things she's doing. And oh boy, is she creepy! <laughs> I will not lie, that was a very creepy operator record, and I enjoyed every second of it. Uh, but yeah, you can find it on the uh, on the channel if you want to take a look at it. But yeah, this ending pretty much confirms why certain humans stay stay in human form even if they fully become seaborn. And that is the full ending. So next time we're go gonna go over ending two. But right now I did say at the beginning that I want to rant about a certain thing about Stultifera, and I want to show you why I think the event is absolutely gutted. Here in the Intermezzi section, uh, pardon, here, 
is obviously where Stultifera is. You enter it, and you're immediately on the map. Now, every single little thing that you can uncover, like this picture, for example, you will get text here, but this picture and every other trinket and so on and so forth has very fat stacks of text below them that you can only access through the backpack that we had in the event. That pack pack backpack is nowhere to be found here and nowhere to be accessed here. No matter where you go in this, you can only traverse between the three different, fa different places of the map uh, through the extra stages that open up later and through the extra extra stages that open up at the very end. <clears throat> the S stages. And yes, every single one of these, for example, hold on, let's go back here. This, for example, this, um, what was it called again? The Dusty Picture Book, for example, carried, let's see, yeah. This one carries the story, essentially, of Breogan, the eager who pretty much delivered the technology to Iberia to become a powerhouse before the profound silence hit. And this story is handled in these pictures and uh, throughout other uh, places. And sadly, if you even, even if you click this for the first time, I do not know if you get the text of the picture here right now. When you click for, on it for the first time, only new players who haven't done this event can, can tell me that. Uh, but yeah, none of this stuff is accessible in the Intermezzi section. And there was a ton of lore. Like, holy shit, was there a ton of lore and background knowledge. And none of it exists anymore. <laughs> None of it, sadly, exists anymore in the game, unless you're gonna wait until the um, rerun, where the menu is gonna be obviously functional and the backpack is gonna be obviously functional anymore. And that's why I said at the beginning, if you want the entire experience and not be constrained by time or wait until then, well, the links are in the description. Feel free to go and watch the entire story. The story is great. The background knowledge about Iberia and Eger is amazing uh, and was a good read to, well, see how everything uh, was happening and went down. And yeah, it's very sad that it's not available in, in game anymore. Kind of, it's kind of a pain because you, if you want to get all of the extra uh, lore entries for every single item and see uh, what is written on them, you need to go to a wiki page essentially. <laughs> Which is very cumbersome, in my opinion at least. But yeah, anyway, this will be it for today's first part. Uh, if you've liked this video, please consider leaving a like. It helped me a lot and means a lot to me, so thank you very much in advance. Uh, if you're new to the channel, consider subscribing. There's a lot more on the channel, as you've undoubtedly already realized from me just talking about it. And uh, yeah, I hope you have a fantastic day wherever you are, and I will see you in the next video. Until then, bye-bye.